Uh, this is the I, welcome to the IOE Rough Cut Seminar Series. I'm Bruce Maxwell, Director of IOE here at MSU, and with us today is Dr. Uh, William Bill Kleindl, and he is going to talk to us about uh, his research. But before that, I'll say that he uh, give you some of his academic credentials. He has a BA in Botany from the University of Wisconsin, a master's in uh, urban stream ecology, University of Washington, and a PhD in systems ecology from the University of Montana, wherever that is. Um, and uh, that I wanted to, to, to say that Bill has, has wears many hats here and is associated with many different projects and I'll, I'll let him uh, elaborate on that if, if you would like. But um, he's a, a, currently a research assistant professor in the Land Resources and Environmental Science Department and uh, teaches a number of courses. And stuff. So, Bill, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm going to put the rough in rough cut, just to let you know. I was just telling, uh, I was just telling him that I was, spent the last two weeks in the Mojave Desert and uh, at night huddling over a cheap hotel table trying to do R on my laptop and then realizing that I was missing some crucial files. and It was exciting. Um, but uh, I wanted to start out with this Google Earth Engine time lapse website. And if you're not familiar with it, you go to you can just look it up on the internet, so you can get to the to the time lapse thing immediately without uh, um, using that as a clock, not as a disturbance device. Um, so uh, uh, it's a it's a great tool. It's it's tied into all the data that's available through Google Earth, and if you want to do remote sensing, you can become part of their research team pretty easily and, and use those data, which is extremely extremely helpful. But this time-lapse thing you, takes advantage of Landsat imageries from 1984 to, you can see the time moving on it right here, the time moving in the corner down here. Uh, and man, I can stare at these things all day. It just reminds me of, you know, when my first became fascinated with this in Steve Dexter's basement when I was 14, you know, like listening to Led Zeppelin, right? <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if we could see time and space all at once? So it took several decades to get there. Here we are. But I wanted to, to point out a couple of, of, uh, of things of interest, mostly around this area here. This is Glacier Park right here. And this is the river that we're going to be talking about today is the Flathead. It starts up here, North Fork of the Flathead. There's the Middle Fork comes into the main stem and then down to Flathead Lake. And, and right about here, I want you to pay attention to what's going on right there. You see that big scar that comes in right around 2001, right there. Big fire that rips across that landscape. You can see it moving. And it's these kind of dynamics that, man, I just want to bottle it somehow. You know, it's fun to look at, but man, it is hard to wrap your hands around it. So I um, wanted to get you an idea about that stuff. Oh, there, that's Paul. <laughs> Scott Paul, how do, we, how do we share it? Where's the share button? <laughs> The bottom, where? <laughs> Share a screen right there. Hey, Scott. <laughs> All right. Okay, share a screen. Everybody likes Scott Paul. All right. <laughs> so, uh, um, now this is, uh, uh, how do I get that little bar to go away up there? It'll go away. It will it though? Okay. So uh, I changed this, uh, this title screen uh, last night because I came across this guy, Eaton Jacobs, who does these, but does it go away? <laughs> is, the, is the mouse over it? I will, uh, no. All right. Um, I stumbled onto this guy's uh, website last night on some art website that I was looking at. And, and although I made probably the coolest gif ever made in a science talk, uh, they're not anywhere nearly as awesome as these, but somehow I, you know, that's what I sort of think is going on with ecosystems, this sort of dynamic pulsing component. And if I could somehow have my science show that, that would be exciting. But uh, for now, that's just an idea of the dynamics that we're looking at. Um, this idea of ecosystem dynamics is not new, of course, you know, this, we can talk all the way back to Borman and Lichen and in the 70s and they were looking at forests and you know a, let's say there's a wind tip up or a, a small fire 
and there's a disturbance within that forest, and then that disturbance goes through, through succession pathways and goes to shrub and the, and the young trees, and then, those, then that gap is filled up with a canopy again. And those guys said, you know, this can happen anywhere in the forest at any particular time. And if we look across all of time, we would see these patches in different places, and those patches would move around. And uh, somehow we could also define the edge of those patches when the entire forest would turn over as the natural range of variation that eventually all the forest would be affected by this disturbance and recovery somehow. Um, <clears throat> and those, that idea has been, been, been moved around a lot, a lot of modeling efforts with it. Um, one, one thing that captured my attention was this idea of the of Oval Borman and Lichen came up with this shifting habitat mosaic and how it was applied to rivers with uh, Stanford and Howard and the work I did up at uh, a Flathead Station. Those guys, those guys said not only do things shift in plan view, they also shift because rivers operate in four dimensions, longitudinally, laterally, vertically, and temporally, uh, that those shiftings occur across all of those, those components. And well, I think one contribution that was uh, interesting with the shifting mosaic with Stanford and those folks was what's going on subsurface with the flow pathways and the hyperreic complexities that occur. Um, that really captured my attention, but I didn't look at the, the vertical component, but back to the plan view, I was interested in not only, uh, uh, most of the work they did was on the NIAC, and most of the work on shifting habitat mosaic and floodplains were on single floodplains around the world, a few papers on that. I wanted to look at what happens in an entire watershed. Uh, so in this case, I, I, I looked at this, the North Fork of the Flathead, and I, I developed a, a several interconfluence reaches. Those are when those confluences reach the top and the bottom, and that's where I cut it off. At. I took 100 random points within that, and I laid those points over top of NAEP imagery, and I classified it under um, these 12 land, land cover classes. I'm just gonna run through them quickly because uh, we'll refer to these numbers later. This is uh, NAEP imagery. This is a plan view from, from a, a flight over we did. But we've got, um, Mature conifer, uh, mature deciduous, uh, river, cobble, uh, side channels, um, herbaceous on top of cobble, uh, young saplings, willows and such, shrubs, uh, some grasslands, and then we've got ag or logging activities and urbanization and then immature conifer. Those are the 12 cover types that I classified on using this nape imagery. And from that, now the nape imagery or the quarter quads are not, you know, they're, they're, they're periodic, right? There's, the core, there's a 1991 quarter quad at sub-meter or one meter resolution. The next, the first nape imagery was 2003. So that's a big gap in between. And that's where the middle of that fire happened, right? But from that, I could take those points and I say, oh, here's a point that was forest, mature conifer, in this year, and that same point was a uh, grassland um, shrub with burn scars in it somewhere else in, in, in 2003. And I could attribute that to the fire because it was within the fire scar, I could see burn scars. So I associated that change with fire. And you see in this alluvial graph, you see um, uh, that there's a, that this flow from these points that were mature conifer to, to grasslands are flowing through this uh, fire disturbance component. Um, a lot of things moved as they go from river to cobble. That's, that's water driven. Some of the mature conifer was cut down and turned into by logging that's driven by humans. Uh, and then there's also um, places where there's uh, recovery where this, some of these sites that were cobble turned into um, young saplings or, or herbaceous stuff on top of cobble and you can see that moving. So, then if I look at that across time, from 91 to 2013, you can see these are the big gaps between those, those imagery. You can see this alluvial change of disturbance and recovery vectors sort of linearly across time. And <coughs> um, does this define the natural range of variation? Like very quickly, Ellis, everybody will say no way. Because some studies that were done in, in uh, trying to define where that natural range of variation occurs in, in uh, Yellowstone, say it would take four, 500 years for it to, to cross through that natural range of variation. But 
I, I want to switch to the, to a uh, concept of, of contemporary range of variation. And I think that's an important concept because especially later, and we'll talk about as we, we look at what these ecosystems do in providing the ecosystem services that benefit humans, uh, we have adapted our economies and our lifestyles based on a contemporary range of variation. As long as it stays within that contemporary range, everything's copacetic. When it starts to leave that contemporary range and things start to get uh, a little nervous. So, um, but, oh, back here again, let me back up one. Uh, one thing that I didn't point out is this gray here. Now this gray is, is where nothing happens. And it turns out a lot of nothing happens out there in, in the, in between two, 1991 and 2013. A lot of things just stay the same. And if we look at this adjacency matrix, we can see that in this, this line here. Those are all the, all those black numbers are things that were at any time, I, can, I, I put these all together over those 27 years, and at any time, one, uh, some of, most of these mature conifer forests remained as mature conifer forests. They didn't, they didn't change at all, right? But some of them changed to, and here's kind of a arrows when we're showing down here, some of them changed to um, herbaceous on cobble, or some of them changed to uh, immature uh, uh, willows and such. Fields, um, sorry, shrub, field, a lot of them turned to field, and you see that number, 231? That's really driven by that big fire that happened. So from these adjacency matrix, now this is all 20, this is looking at it all at once, this change all at once. From these adjacency matrices, I can make a network. And the thickness, these nodes, these are nodes, are the cover types. These are called edges in the, in the network language, are the, uh, what you saw in those numbers, those adjacency table numbers. So that 231 that turned from mature conifer to uh, grassland, that's this big thick line here. So the thicker the line, the more that happens. Now, um, why these colors in little circles? What, what you can run through these, these networks is something called a uh, random, a walk trap uh, algorithm, where you send a little pulse of information and that pulse of information bounces through that adjacency table and they get stuck in these changes. And when they get stuck in those changes, they create a community of change and recovery. And then occasionally they pop out into another one and they get stuck over there, they get trapped. And then these, there's our three basic traps in this random walk. And those three basic traps show that these are mostly driven by changes in the river, right adjacent to the river, because that moves a lot, right? The river moves a lot. Um, as after it moves, it, it, it goes through a, uh, in, it goes through uh, herbaceous to immature to mature deciduous. And then again, this is the mature conifer being burned or being logged and turning to urbanization. So then we took an expanded in this paper, expanded this idea of the shifting habitat mosaic being purely hydrologically driven to, to also including fire regimes and urbanization and logging. So, well, that's all well and good, but who cares, right? So, I mean, it's, it's interesting in terms of science, like, you know, that's, that's fun, but I, I, one thing that Bruce didn't say in my introduction is I spent, you know, and still do uh, almost 27 years of, of consulting around the Clean Water Act. And a lot of the questions, and the reason why I went back to get a PhD is we started, the consulting world and the management world started to ask questions that I couldn't answer as a consultant, right? So questions about how, do, how does climate change affect this system? Or how do we tease out human disturbance from climate-driven disturbance? And, and what happens when the system varies across time? Those are kind of questions that are not your standard questions in consultancy. So those are the questions I'm chasing down in my research, but always with a, an applied eye to help those guys answer those questions. Namely, Let's look at this. We have a, this fill in waters of the U.S. Um, this is a loss of wetlands between 1780 and, and 1980. And you can see in these egg, really egg dominated areas, lost almost all of the wetlands that are there. Um, since the 1950s, there were between 50s and 70s before the Clean Water Act was signed in, there was a lot of acres still being lost. But after the Clean Water, the Clean Water Act was signed in, those, that law started to diminish because people started paying more attention to it, especially around this idea of no net loss. 
which was a policy that was brought into play by George Bush the Greater, which is different than George Bush the Lesser, um, that uh, uh, he said, and it was, uh, he said that there'll be no loss of wetland function or values. And that was reaffirmed by every president since, uh, or most every president since. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, so this idea of how do we measure that ecosystem functions and those ecosystem values is difficult. However, since that came out in 1990, there was a, there was a huge explosion, and that's, well, that's what I got involved in when I finished my master's. I started working with these, building these assessment tools all around the country. And they're, they're mostly based on an idea of multi-metric indices. And those, each one of those metrics are, are defined by having a range of disturbance along some kind of gradients where we go out and measure those things. We measure all the stuff in, in this floodplain, including the roads and the, the shrub density and the microtopography and the width to death ratios and everything you can measure in the field. And we do that from, from stuff that's absolutely hammered in the middle of cities to some uh, pre-Lewis and Clark system that we can find out there. And then, and then we can get a, a gradient of the response of each one of these system uh, structural components across that gradient. And, <clears throat> and I just threw this together. So I'm not saying that these are data, but this gives a rough idea. So as we go across that gradient from low disturbance to high disturbance, we may see a monotonic decline in microtopography on the floodplain, or we may see a frequency of of flooding decreasing until they rip wrap it and then just disappears, right? Um, as they harden the system, bank stability may, may be really well until it hits some threshold and then just, just like just totally starts to fall apart. And large weight debris might be pulled out immediately as soon as this disturbance, as soon as we find ourselves along that disturbance gradient. So um, the idea of each one of those attributes interacting in different ways to support function. Now that, that idea is going back to the 60s with Odom and even earlier with this relationship with structure and function. Um, the, so building on that idea, we say, <coughs> and this, uh, this is, has to do with, um, this example is from HGM, Hydrogeomorphic Functional Assessment Model, that came out after that no net, no, no net loss policy came into play. So um, the idea is that we, we search for indicators, look for indicators that are ecologically meaningful and respond across that gradient and can be measured, that response can be measured and they turn into metrics. Those metrics interact in a variety of ways to give you an idea of the capacity of the system to perform the function. I wanna make sure that's really clear. It's not a measure of function, it's a measure of the system's capacity to perform that function. There's a distinction there because Measuring the functions hard, right? It takes time and, and a lot of data, but measuring, but you make assumptions about the capacity of the system based on this relationship with its structure. Um, there's a lot of uh, models out there that rely on, on, on um, uh, existing research that says that these are the typically the kind of functions that can occur in, in wetlands, export of organic carbon, characteristic faunal habitat, we build a model for each one of those typical types of functions. And then from that, we can go into this, this system, apply a suite of multi-metric models and say, okay, this is generally what this is across these functions, right? Um, EPA has set up a three-tiered assessment approach. Tier two is what I just talked about, rapid assessment. The, the idea of rapid assessment is that two qualified individuals can go in the field in a half a day, collect data, apply it to an already built guidebook that says, these are, you apply your data, this is where your data fits across that gradient, so this is the score of those, of those attributes, and then we can run those attributes through those, through those functional capacity indices. Um, ideally, those, that range and those scores are directly related to intensive site monitoring. That's the kind of stuff that you get from NEON or from your own work that helps inform these rapid assessment things. That's, that's, those are tier three. Tier one is, uh, is landscape and remote sensing assessment. And they kind of think that it's the lowest bar or the easiest to get to. And from my experience, man, it is not easy at all. It's super hard. <laughs> and we'll get into that in a second. But um, that comes from status and trends like National Wetland Inventory. Um, now this, 
these models have been around forever, these multimetric models. This, they went all the way back to the Saprobian indices for water quality back in the early 1900s. Around 1980, there was a big interest in assessing the quality of a, of a wetland or aquatic system to see what its integrity is. And then the no net loss policy came in and then these, these functional assessment models started to show up, but they were hard because they had like square roots in them and stuff. And people were just like, I'm not doing a square root. What are you thinking? That's nuts. So they started making up their own. And that's when these EBAB models, that's everybody and their brother, just started making these things. Because there's no like, you have to use this model. They just started making them like mad. And literally there are well over 400 of these out there that are published and used. And it is a junk show. In fact, it's such a junk show, we published a paper on like how to find your way through this junk show. It didn't really help, but, but at least it gave some kind of guidance. Um, so let's get back to this thing. Like um, this, I think that I really think this well hasn't been plumbed for the kind of how can we take this this uh, network data and and come up with a, a meaningful metrics that are ecologically meaningful. Like I'm, I nerded out really hard on it. I got really excited about it. Read a bunch of books. Played around with um, iGraph, which is a great network graph in R. Um, and uh, I started to just to fool around with using that adjacency, those adjacency uh, tables, those adjacency tables inform probability. And that through that probability, I can model what would it be like if I increase the, um, decrease the flooding on the system, try to dry the system up, or increase the ag to such extent that I, I dike the entire river out. And then I ran that random walk algorithm. And you can see that, uh, as the, as the system dries up, some of these links disappear. And then as the dike goes through, you can see all of these just get cut off eventually. And this is most of the stuff that happens in the upper part of the watershed. Um, still interacts with each other, but the flooding drivers are go away. And uh, yeah, that really didn't help. Like I was confusing. Like I didn't know how to find any metrics out of that thing. It's interesting to look at, of course. And I think it helps to find what potential, like I think there's some rich fodder for examining uh, threshold changes and some other things, but not really those metric components. So um, I started to look at longitudinal studies with uh, social networks. So let's say you're on Facebook and then Facebook changes their, and you have a network of all these people you interact with, right? And then network, the, then Facebook changes the algorithm so that you only see people that you push like to when you go to Facebook, which is what they did a couple of years back. And then they can go in and look at what, how does the network, how does your relationship with your friends change after we change that, that algorithm? And the algorithm in that case could be the perturbation, the fire, what have you. So uh, uh, we have network A, we have some kind of disturbance, either a change in the algorithm or change in uh, something that happens in the ecological system, then we have network B. The social analytics folks are really interested in information transfer between nodes. So centrality is a big driver for those guys. So when you read a lot about what, what are these um, analytics that are used to determine the change, these longitudinal studies, it really has to do with a lot with centrality. So, and centrality is basically how efficient does information move through the system. And there's a whole suite of those out there, but are they ecologically meaningful? So here's, uh, uh, eigenvector centrality. So the bigger the circle, the more important it is or more central it is for the disturbance recovery, right? So it has to pass through. In this case, you see cobble really change a lot because everything happens, everything becomes cobble eventually when there's flooding. Um, or, and, but this is when I am decreasing the flooding event, right? So more cobble is happening because the system's drying. All right, that's cool. <laughs> so, but, uh, uh, and this is diking, kind of the same thing. Also relates to just it being cool, but when I look at uh, these whole suite of centrality measures, I, um, I really can't find anything that I can turn into a metric, right? That's the part that, there is something very interesting that occurs once I dike the entire thing, right around 90%, the system collapses in some way. But that's not really informative across these kind of gradients. Maybe it's more like number three, but... Um, uh, I, I don't think that this this well has been completely plumbed yet. I believe there's depth there, and but I set it aside. Uh, uh, I I've since expanded this data set to include the last several years of NAEP imagery, and and I'm working with a mathematician right now to to do some matrix algebra and trying to we're plumbing that up. That's 
coming up soon. Um, this paper toward an ecological theory of forest macrosystems for improved ecosystem management. Kleindl and Stoy, two, two esteemed authors in this room right now, just got published this morning, which is very exciting. So uh, don't rush the podium when the talk's over. We can get you copies. Um, uh, but in this, uh, in this paper, we, we presented this, this figure here. Um, mostly that how does, how does structure, when we think about structure at, at a site scale, as we move up in, in spatial scale, what, how does those structures change or what becomes important or what, what, what disappears as we increase in scale and what, what emerges as we increase in scale. And the same thing goes for ecosystem functions. We've got a whole suite of, of, of ideas and papers and measurements for ecosystem functions and, and we apply those across all scales, but they may not necessarily be realistic across all scales. Some of those functions may no longer be relevant, microclimate, for instance, versus weather attenuation, which may be an earth system uh, function. So the, the next step, and that's what this paper proposes, is the next step is we need to, we need to just try to define what these structures are at, at these different scale components and what those functions are at those different scale components if we keep stick to this structure and function relationship. So that's the heavy lifting that Paul and I are gonna do starting tomorrow. Right, and um, oh, and this is the seizure warning. This is my fault. So uh, the assumption also is that that as these structures vary in time, like like the uh, um, the uh, Google Earth time lapse image that we saw in the beginning, as the, as all that stuff varies, as all the structural components vary, then the the structure the function should also vary. Not necessary relation, not necessarily related to disturbance, right? to human disturbance, and that's most of the things that we've seen, the disturbance, as disturbance increases, the capacity for the system to perform the function decreases because of human, because of simplification of the system because of humans or, or because of the impacts on, or loss of structural components because of human disturbance. This was mostly thinking about what happens when we have undisturbed systems that have natural, I'm sorry, unperturbed systems to try to distinguish between perturbations from humans and disturbance from natural events. If we have unperturbed systems that have a natural disturbance regime, do those functions still pulsate, right, to, to, as the structure changes? So, um, and this is the cool GIF I made, right? Not as cool as the other one that I had up there, but this is about as cool as it's gonna get out of me. Uh, uh, so it seemed like uh, dense time stacks from Landsat can start to offer those kind of questions. So Landsat flies from, well, all, all the way from the early 70s, but really 1984 with Landsat 5, what I'm focusing on. And those things fly over every two weeks um, since 1984. That's a lot of information. But as, as uh, uh, Al Gore said, there, there are, and I'm paraphrasing, there's millions of these Landsat images that no one has ever used because the bar is so high to go from Landsat image to, to usable data to do analytics with. It's really high and you have to be a specialist to even get there. And it's super frustrating and, the, and that's kind of the frustration that I've been dealing with since about January. But fortunately there's, there's, a, there's a product called the National Land Cover Database, which all of that processing has been complete and it's available for end users to, to be able to work with without having that kind of classification, thematic classification specialization, which is super helpful. So in this paper that um, I did with Scott and, and, and Rick Hauer, we said, okay, well, let's look at, let's look at this assessment tool and uh, apply this national land cover database because it's a low hanging fruit. But, but what happens when, the thing is that all maps are, are lie to you they're all wrong, and some are useful, as the map people have to say. Um, but that that uh, misclassification that occurs in these maps, how do we address the misclassification with an assessment tool? So all these assessment tools that I've been talking about up till now, they're all naive to error. Nobody ever checks error ever in any of those tools, and they assume the answer they give you is the answer that is real. So you can get away with that for the most part because 
you know, you show up with a white coat and a clipboard, you can get away with most things. But when you show up with a white coat and a clipboard and a map, but, but the map also has an, a, a, an error document associated with it, right? So you can't get away with it anymore because it's already written out for you. This is what the error is on this map. So I developed a, a, an assessment tool that's spatial. Runs from the, uh, this one I'm gonna talk about right now just goes from the US part because the National Uncovered Database only goes to the Canadian border. And then I uh, uh, came up with a really simple model that um, gave a naive uh, output, naive of misclassification, that incorporated map error into multiple realizations of that map uh, through multiple iterations, and then, and then ran the assessment at each iteration, and then have a second output that includes that error and the two compared the two. And I add this in here because it's important for the next step we're going to do. Um, <laughs> so, um, in this case, we have uh, uh, this whole suite of sites, these interconfluent sites that come down from the North Fork, there's the Middle Fork and the, south, and the Main Stem. Here's one of these sites, and this is the floodplain based on a uh, break in topography and uh, other surface features. And then I put a one kilometer buffer around that floodplain. And that's just, just picked it out of, out of the air, one kilometer, there's no specific reason. And developed two simple metrics that, are, that show that response of across the disturbance regime. Perturbation based on what's, what's uh, natural or native cover and what is human-based cover. And then fragmentation is how fragmented this, this um, uh, cover is. And the condition is really simple. Add those two together and divide by two. But I did it for the buffer. And um, I, I'm having a really hard time. I'm just gonna turn on this laser pointer right there. So uh, I did it for the buffer and then I incorporated the, that condition, buffer condition into the whole uh, buffer and floodplain and average those. And then, like, genius, and then the clicker doesn't work. It's so awesome. Okay. Um, so to get to those, I, uh, uh, here's the NAEP imagery to show what the ground looks like. This is the National Land Cover Database map. So, you know, there's already a loss of information, clearly, right? Um, a lot of, many of the 16 land covers in national, in that, in that N NL, National NLDC uh, map is, is a, they're all a large suite of them are the native or natural cover. So I pooled those together and made five land, land cover classes, natural and then a variety of human land covers. I also made a binary map for the fragmentation. From the, the natural land covers, I scored unmanaged lands. They get a score of one because what I want this scores to be between zero and one. So one's awesome, right? Uh, low intensity ag like pasture is not as awesome, but it's pasture, so deer can hang out. Uh, high intensity is row crops. Uh, low intensity urban is, uh, you know, our house. It's got bird feeders, but that's about, you know, that's about it. And then this middle of the city, so we get a zero for that. And then spatially average per site. The binary map goes through this MSPA fragmentation map uh, tool which you can run, run through, uh, I didn't get an, an executable in R and ran it through there. That's the thing I left behind when I was down in the desert for the last two weeks. So uh, that was awesome. Um, uh, th that, that outputs this, this, this kind of map. What it, you know, these are core and edges along those cores and unmanaged uh, lands, human, human lands, and then there's a couple of islands of a tree or two out in the fields. And I scored those as core areas being the best and, and islands that are out by themselves being not so good and managed lands being a zero. And then again, spatially average them. And then when I ran it through this, this uh, index, I got a relationship where as we move downstream, we increase human disturbance and the score goes down. So that's, that's the way they're supposed to look, right? That's a good job with the index, but that is naive of, of of air. So in these multiple simulation maps, I took each individual pixel, used the, used the confusion matrix as a probability. A confusion matrix says, well, you, we said, um, you told us it was forest. We mapped it as forest, good job for us, but we also mapped it around two or 3% as grassland, right? That's where the confusion happened. 
So I can take that two or 3% and add that into a probability simulation and say, well, every 2% of every time I run this simulation is gonna be grass, right? Or it's gonna be urban or whatever. And then I can create these simulated maps and then run it through that fragmentation tool. And then I can run it again through that same scoring process. And then I end up with, with a range of possible scores given that, that miscalculation. Here's our naive scores and here's our possible scores given that miscalculation. Um, and uh, one thing, because we relied on the confusion matrix provided by National Land Cover Database, we didn't go out and collect the data ourselves. That we had to, we don't know really where the spatial air, like the, how the um, spatial structure of that air exists in, in reality. So we had to just rely on what they gave us. So without knowing that, we have to be conservative. That's one lesson we learned. Um, oops, here's the scores. The stars are the, na are the naive scores, and the, the box and whisker are the um, air that was pushed through the simulation um, components that I did. And you'll see up here that the, the naive score scored better than the air. And as we get down to these more urban areas, they scored about the same, or sometimes the, the air scored a little bit better than the naive scores. Um, I checked for bias, basically just met naive minus the simulated scores, and came up with some other lessons that each metric responds differently to uncertainty. So each metric, and these are only two metrics here, but as we move on with the work that Paul and I are gonna do, we're, we'll come up with a lot more. Right? But we have to rely on remote sensing to get there with the air, so we gotta understand that. Um, that the, within each metric, they respond differently to the underlying land cover, the air does. Uh, the effects of the bias are, are attenuated when you add all the metrics together into an index. And, uh, and naive scores tend to overestimate the ecological condition in the least impacted sites and underestimate the ecological condition in the more impacted sites. So that, those are important lessons as we move on into the, to the, next, the next component, which is basically where I'm at now. This is the rough part of the rough guide. Right? So you know, I've, I've brought you right up to the edge of where I am. And, and what I've been trying to do is take this, um, to try to capture that, this, this pulsating dynamics. And what does that mean? How do we measure that? And, and then apply that across these spatial components. But for simplicity's sake, I'm still gonna stick with those two metrics. But what I did uh, since January was take a, a dense uh, stack, time stacks of, of Landsat using near anniversary dates in midsummer, only Landsat 5 between 1984 and 2011. Because after, after Landsat 5 went down and it went mm -hmm. to, it, uh, one to the more contemporary Landsats, the changes in, in their sensors and it required uh, more coding than I wanted to get into. So, so uh, Landsat 5 gives a lot of, a lot of years, so 27 years. Um, and I would take these near anniversary dates in the summer and sort them by the uh, lowest cloud cover and then take the, what they have is called tier one level one, which is the highest quality QA data. And uh, surface reflectance, and then radiometrically normalize those across all years, and then um, classify those using the training data from that, those NAEP imageries that I showed you earlier. And then I haven't but will apply this logic rule using those probabilities of transitions from that uh, adjacency matrix that I showed you that help inform what's likely, if it's cobble this year, it's not gonna be mature forest next year, it's impossible. Right, because the probabilities are way too low on the adjacency table. So if that happens, we have to correct those misclassifications. Basically, it's all about limiting as much error as possible initially, and then do the confusion matrix, and then um, have these 27 maps with confusion matrix associated with them. Right? Um, oops, from those 27 maps, I apply that. I'm just, just what I'm gonna show you now is this is that perturbation and fragmentation those perturbation and fragmentation metrics, but there'll be more metrics as we start to think about it. And what this is, is a proof of concept for the kind of stuff that Paul and I are working on with this macrosystems project, which is looking at, um, and frankly, I'm doing that because it's taken a long time for me to wrap my head around what the structure of systems are as I dig a hole 
and crash through the bushes. I can see those things and measure them or pull tape and I can count them, right? And then they're like, no, we're gonna use Landsat now and it's 30 meters and it took forever to try to figure out what 30 meters is and the loss of resolution that you get. But Landsat, I would argue, may not be sufficient for the kind of macro systems work we're getting into and we have to move to MODIS at 250 meters or beyond and you know, we lose that, we lose the grain on, the, on what we understand, but we also are asked to come up with new, with new structural components, but they have to be grain related. It'll all be in our wonderful philosophy paper that Paul and I are gonna be writing <laughs> shortly as we try to wrap our heads around what it means to see the world in different ways. Um, but so this is a proof of concept for some of those things. And, and uh, cause I can, I can wrap my head around 30 meters. But once I get to these, uh, um, I'll, I'll run through that, initially run through the same perturbation and fragmentation metrics and we come up with a distribution over time of those 30 years. What I've yet to do is also run that air simulation to distinguish how much of this distribution is related to air and how much of this distribution is real change, right? So that's the part that has to be separated. But let's look at what we got here. So this thing, these were just made yesterday. So it's just hot off the press. Um, and it sort of makes sense, sort of. I think there's some problems here. But if we're looking at just the perturbation, right, which is the difference between how much of the ground is made up of natural cover and how much of the ground is made up of, of managed lands from humans. And this is high up in the watershed. And as we move down, this is down in the uh, Kalispell Valley. This is Canada. So um, Canada, uh, they have a lot of logging up there, right up the Canadian border. The Canadian border starts around 27, right about there is the Canadian border. So uh, there's logging uh, in the riparian area and definitely in the buffers. And then it gets into Glacier Park on, on river left and, and uh, state forest land on river right. So you get, you get logging on this side, no logging on this side. So um, my idea when I, I didn't put these hypotheses up here, but my idea was that I would see more variation in the structure in, in, the, least, uh, in the areas with the least human impact. And as, as humans harden up and ecosystems become more simplified and more hardened in urban areas, I expect the variation to decrease, right? Not really, I don't know, there's a lot of variation here in, in this, uh, down here. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I, 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 this, is, this is the rough cut part rough cut part, right? I, I think there's a lot of mapping error going on here. I think there's a whole lot of mapping cleanup that I have to do, but um, it's interesting to see. Um, so we do see some kind of signal as we become more urban. And then this is just wrong. Like there's, I did something wrong here. This is flat wrong. So, so uh, uh, like we shouldn't be getting like almost zeros in some of these areas in the buffer area with fragmentation. Or maybe, maybe this is all the logging stuff that's really driving this fragmentation because it is logged. I did really well. Like I had the the overall uh, accuracy I had in these maps were in the upper 90, 90s. You know, like ninety it was around ninety percent, eighty nine ninety percent accuracy, which is pretty good for thematic maps. And and the, and the logging was was really well uh, picked up as well. So maybe all this is fragmentation is relation to logging. But like I said, I was in the desert. And I came I came across my executable uh, yesterday and just cranked these out yesterday. So I had no really chance to look at the maps and really dig into these things. But, um, and as we add these together in an index, like we saw in the previous paper, the, those, that variation attenuates. So there's an interesting component there as we add these, the, lots of variation in the structure, and we add those all together and come up with this distribution across the time. Um, and remember this, each one of these things, like this one here is, these are all the possible scores that have happened across 27 years for this particular site, okay? So that's really variable, right or wrong, don't know but I find it interesting. And by the next time I actually give this talk at a conference, I should have this all cleaned up. But uh, that's the rough cut part. And I think, that, I think that these kind of variations we're seeing in here is the kind of stuff that is going on here. And connecting these two is gonna be the fun part. Why, uh, let's back to this, this is from that paper we just published again. We have this idea of structure and function, right? Um, and ecosystem functions produce, have sink and source products that they output. You know, they, 
sequester carbon or they, they release dissolved organic carbon. And those, those things in the literature, in the, in the services literature are, are called um, intermediate services. And those intermediate services support these final services that benefit humans' uh, well-being and economies, like uh, provisioning, for instance. Um, all that, we argue, can be assessed. And that assessment is what translates all of these complexities, right? We do the heavy lifting and we provide the easy answer to the managers because those managers, and uh, you know, some of them are, are, are only do ecosystems every single day and, that's, and they're really astute and they're very well read. Others are in a meeting that just got done talking about new swing sets at the, at the park and then turn to the next agenda and it's ecosystem condition, right? So you've got to be able to translate that information to those guys. And then those kind of decisions that they make drive structure and function, right? So this idea of the relationship between, between uh, floodplain functions or ecosystem functions, the, the uh, sink and source output that they provide uh, in terms of services and how those relate to final goods and services, this linkage is, is yet to be filled in. That's another part of my efforts that I'm not getting into today. But the assumption is that if, if these, these ecosystem functions are shifting in time, then wouldn't the services also shift in time? And if that fluctuating ecosystem services, how does that fit into economic models? Um, and that gets back to the, the values part of this no net loss component. When we go out and do these measurements, we have to say that yes, your measurements are reliable, even though these systems fluctuate in time, they're still within some bounded range that's important. Um, so with that, I'll leave you with this, with this thought from Alan Watts. Yeah, the only way to make sense out of change is to plunge right into it, uh, which is what I'm doing, <laughs> I guess. Do uh, you have any questions? So in the, you're, you're looking for, for patterns, of, or my sense is patterns that you need to see to apply. And that you have, what well, you didn't say it was really an expectation of, you know, what's the hypothesis there? Is it, is it a random, I mean, do you have anything sort of a null condition you can estimate? Is it a random set of, of events and processes? Are there dynamics at different scales? You have a hypothesis. Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm repeating the questions I was told to. Is there, is there a, a null state that I can compare against or is a hypothesis? Um, I, uh, that's a good question. So in the network theory, there's, there are random networks and, and you test against, is it different than randomness? So those, those are available and likely will be tested, right? That's as I get into these adjacency matrices. Um, uh, but this side, this this looking at it from Landsat point of view, um, you know, if you think about the scientific method, right? First we observe, then we then we come up with with uh, hypotheses, and then we test those hypotheses. I would argue that this is the observation part, right? Um, the hypothesis that I do think that that is testable is uh, first separating the, the the range of variability from from error in the map. Um, and 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 making sure that the range is not related to error, and once the error is there, then I, well, I think one interesting hypothesis goes towards this ecological simplification and uh, novel ecosystem approaches, which I think is uh, arising out of, of global change um, that systems are simplifying in general, right? And when they simplify, are they hardened? And would we see the kind of variability in those simplified systems? So to test the to look at the variability across the gradient disturbance. And I think that the gradient disturbance in this case is not as broad as it should be. There should be more urban and more impacted sites. That uh, the, the hypothesis that I, I think is measurable is, is that systems that are, are um, have natural, natural disturbance have a wider variability than, than per perturbed systems, which would narrow the variability. So I think that's a testable hypothesis. But, uh, but as, a, as an applied tool, 
um, I didn't even know if it's a valuable applied tool. I think that's a good question. First off, like, do they really want it? Because most people, like, this is, goes way beyond square root in your, in your you know, assessment index. So, so um, I think it's important. I don't know if it's so much, it'll turn as much as a tool as an inf information about how site or naive single visit sites are applied in context with, with assessment that incorporates air and dynamics. So like the big thing about the, about the incorporation of the air is that the naive score really didn't matter. There's still, it still shows a change across, time, across space. It may not be exact, but that exactness is not that important. So, um, so the tool can still be used given the air. And I think that probably, you know, I think that'd be useful outcome is this, is tools could also still can be, can use given the dynamics, maybe. But I think that answer has to be, has to be come up with. That makes sense? So it's, it's, it's assessment stands, and this is a, a, a quote that I like to refer to. Assessment stands in the uncomfortable places, a woman named Turnout said this, in the uncomfortable place between the, um, production of science and the application of science. So it, it's not as much science as it is information for management, and it's not as much information management as it is science, right? So it has to be there as a translation tool. So it doesn't necessarily have to be hypothesis driven. Although there's a lot of things to study from a hypothesis point of view, for sure. That I think are fascinating and worth and will be pursued, so. How's that for dodging? <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks.